Hello, everyone. It's Lauren and John. Um, we had plans to be on separate on a split screen so that we could you could see John better, but uh, my computer's not working. So here we are. <laughs> right, we get to be side by side for Christmas, so special occasion. And share a mic. <laughs> right, share a mic. So tis the season. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We know that it's busy for a lot of people, but we also know that um, a lot of people are home tonight, like us, and we just wanted to do something special. And it's Friday, TGIF. So happy holidays uh, to everyone. Hello, Elena and Leanne and Poppy Cat and Julie Holden. You're with us. It's so good to see you. Thank you. I told all my mods, don't worry about being on tonight. We know it's Christmas. And so, Julie, thank you for being here. So what are we going to, oh, and if everyone could hit subscribe on our YouTube channel, that would be so helpful. And I think that we have comments tonight on YouTube, subscribers only, that just sort of helps us keep things a little bit uh, slower. So if you want to comment, just make sure you hit subscribe. So I will give this to Dr. John, babe. <laughs> So we decided we might wade into slightly treacherous water tonight and talk about the uh, John Benet Ramsey case. Lauren and I actually have a little bit of history with this case because uh, we were married in 2016, and that marked the 20th anniversary of the John Benet Ramsey case. So a number of documentaries and updates came out in around Christmas of, or, you know, December of 2016. And we watched all of them and we, it seems like every holiday season we have some debate about the John Benet Ramsey case. So um, obviously it's, it's one of the most covered cases in the history of true crime. So, uh, and people have very strong opinions about it. So uh, I think we're, we're kind of venturing into, um, you know, murky water here a little bit, but um, we do have opinions and we'd love to talk about it and take questions. And um, tonight actually marks the 25th anniversary of this particular case. And it's it's while the parents in 2008 were, um, I don't want to say acquitted, but they were um, they were exonerated to some extent by the DA at the time. That was controversial. Um, the case still remains open and it's unsolved. Yes. Colette, it's good to see you here tonight too. So, right, before we begin, um, you're right. This is a very, people are very passionate about their opinions on this case. And so John and I recognize that what we share are our opinions as professionals and people that have read a lot about the case, um, but they are our opinions and we'll also take questions about it. So, uh, yeah, so just keep that in mind. We understand that not everyone's going to agree with this and, and right. But we, we care about Jean Benet too, as a victim, as a, I think there's one thing that we can all agree on, which is a little six-year-old girl was murdered. And that's really what's most important. And that this case remains cold. If you want to say anything more about Jean Benet? Yeah, I think it's important. I think in revisiting this case, Lauren and I talking about it the last few days, um, I think one of the things we realize is that uh, sometimes Jean Benet, sometimes the victim was kind of lost in the theatrics of this case early on. And uh, I think it's important to remember that this was an amazing, seemed like an amazing little girl and uh, her life was cut short and that was tragic. And uh, it actually reminds me a lot of, of you know, the, the Daybell case, which we obviously talk about a lot in terms of uh, child victims there as well. Um, and for me, um, you know, I've, I've been doing a little bit of research recently on kind of the psychopathology of Hitler. So I've had to revisit World War II stuff somewhat. And, um, you know, one of the things about 
reviewing some of the footage from World War II is that there were a lot of child victims. There were millions of children that were killed during that war. And it's just shocking to see, for me, it's, it's shocking to see piles of dead bodies of children. And I think it's really important to not lose sight of the fact that um, child victims are important and they need to be protected and they need a voice. And, um, you know, it, I can't tell you the amount of, of grief I experienced by watching some of those films. I, you know, it's easy to forget. So I think it's important to keep their memories alive and to acknowledge that um, children are so important and, um, you know, they deserve to, they deserve to live full lives. Yes. Um, and with it being 25 years, uh, Jean Benet, if alive would be 31 right now. So 31 year old woman. And I think what's seared in most people's memory, at least even for me is this beauty pageant image of her and she's beautiful but i think the photos that are less seen are um important which is her as a little girl her playing uh without the makeup and without you know all of the hair done all the beauty queen costumes and she was just a happy little girl with an entire future um ahead of her so thanks for sharing that so <laughs> Yeah, so um so in, in approaching this case, um I I think there's there's basically two camps. Uh the first camp is the camp that believes the family did it, and the second camp is the camp that believes there was an intruder. Uh one of the difficulties in assessing this case is that every piece of evidence is disputed multiple ways. So the problem with this case is people can make a really strong case for the intruder theory and people can make a really strong case for the family's theory. So um, I think that's why it's, it's kind of stood the test of time. The crime scene was hugely contaminated in the first moments that people were allowed into the house. So uh, that didn't help at all, of course, but um but if you step back and look at the big picture, it, there's essentially two choices, I think, in terms of developing a theory of the case. Um, uh, you know, when I think about this case, so I'll start with kind of a big picture view here. Well, Zaneda Rivera has an interesting comment, right? If right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Right, exactly. So that would be that would be the family theory that um, that there was an accident and the family covered it up. And um, just to let the cat out of the cat out of the bag, that's sort of that's our position as well for the most part. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. But um, I want to start with the, I'm going to start with an idea that's a Freudian idea, uh, and. The, the idea, so Freud talked about something called the family romance. And what Freud meant by that was that children tend to idealize, children that are especially in, in families that are, are somewhat dysfunctional, they tend to idealize their parents or over idealize their parents um, for, you know, the reasons of survival and, and because they have to live with these people. So, um, Freud said that oftentimes we, so we develop these idealized versions of our family and we have no basis for comparison, but we do that and we carry that into adulthood often. And he called this the family romance. So back in Victorian Vienna, which is where Freud was, um, the idea of kind of these perfect families, you know, that were, that by, that were by all appearances, um, you know, well dressed, well mannered, right? They were they were considered to be moral. In many cases, they were religious. Um, that kind of set the standard. And I, I think Freud was very interested in looking behind that surface and looking some of the some of the pathology that existed behind that surface. Um, but when you when you step back and really look at this case from the largest perspective, I think what we're really talking about is something like the family romance in terms of 
one theory kind of valorizes this idea of the ideal perfect family, which would be the intruder theory. Because the basic idea behind the intruder theory is that a family like the Ramseys could never, ever do something so heinous. Even in the exoneration in 2008, the DA at the time said, I don't think they were capable of doing this. She wasn't basing that on evidence. She was basing it on the fact that she had this ideal notion of what a family like the Ramseys looks like. So there's that theory. And then there's, you know, the opposite side of the family romance is that you have a family that beneath all appearances is extremely dysfunctional. They're not what they seem to be, and they're capable of committing this type of heinous crime. So you really have two philosophical positions with the Ramseys. Um, you know, the intruder theory essentially is, is letting them off the hook because it's, 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 too painful for people to possibly acknowledge that a family is like the Ramseys, which is a wealthy family. It's a privileged family. They have a beautiful home. All the pictures they take around Christmas are like totally curated and perfect, right? Like people don't want to believe that there's something sinister lurking beneath the surface of this type of family. Um, and so I think that's what really, you know, it's interesting because Lou Smith, who developed the intruder theory, Lou Smith, when he was describing the reasons the Ramses couldn't have done it before he even really was investigating, he said, you know, they didn't do drugs. They didn't drink. Like he had this little checklist of the perfect family. This is Freud's family romance. This is the idea that a family like the Ramses is incapable of committing something so heinous. So it must've been an intruder. So you look at like one of the things that Lou Smith used to to justify that position was the window that, that somebody broke into the window the glass was broken but there's there's another side to that which is that in the first day or so during the investigation one of the police officers asked John Ramsey the father about the broken window and John said oh yeah I broke it because my key I didn't have my key and I needed to get in the house and so I simply needed a way to get in. He basically told you there was no intruder <laughs> in that moment, right? So, but, but because of confirmation bias, when you start with the premise that a family like this can't possibly do something, do something so heinous, you're going to find information that's going to confirm that perspective the whole way, including something as simple as John Ramsey saying, you know what, I broke the window I come in that way. I've come in that way several times. Like that doesn't matter, right? So it becomes an intruder came in and broke the window and the whole thing, you know, melds to fit the theory at hand. <laughs> well said. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned confirmation bias because I think a lot of, in my opinion, confirmation bias did play in this for what, for all the reasons you just said. We have a few interesting comments. Um, Jean Marie says that she's convinced. Jean Marie says she's convinced that Patsy wrote the letter. Patsy is Jean Benet's mom. And then Leanne Hicks says Patsy's handwriting was a huge red flag. Yeah. And Janae Ann, all J's here. That ransom letter was ridiculous. So why don't we um, talk about that piece of evidence? Right. Yeah. That's. The, I agree. I think the. If there's if the most damning piece of evidence in the whole case, I think, is the ransom letter. I think, actually, uh, the, the Ramseys would have had a much better case <laughs> if there was no letter. But um, handwriting analysis has revealed time and time again that Patsy wrote the letter. The, the language is a little eccentric. It seems to match Patsy. Um, there's almost a Hollywood kind of fictitious quality to it, um, which wouldn't be typical of somebody who's concerned about time, getting in and out of a house, taking a child out for ransom, right? They're not going to worry about their language. This, this, this letter looks like something that was very deliberate, that took a lot of time to write. Um, it's almost, you know, as many people have looked at this case have said, um, it's a novel compared to a typical two or three line, two or three sentences in a typical uh, ransom letter. So, but I think, I think to argue that there's an intruder, you have to somehow explain away the letter because the handwriting, it's, you just, I can't, me personally, I can't get past the fact that the handwriting matches Patsy's. 
that it was done on her notepad. It was done in the house. It's so long, right? It, it, you know, Lou Smith, who has the intruder theory, basically tries to explain away the letter by saying, this letter is really ominous. This letter is really, it's, it's, it's really focused on death. And somebody like Patsy could never write a letter like this because it's not within her to do so, that she doesn't have that kind of uh, vicious personality. So, I mean, to me, that's questionable. Let me share a few facts about the letter. Uh, this is something everyone agrees on, whether it's Lou Smith or with who, you know, is right, the father of the intruder theory, <laughs> uh, as well as those who believe the family is responsible, that it was written in the house. That's really important. The, the ransom letter was written, not only was this very long novel written in the house, but, <coughs> excuse me, um, there was a draft as well. So they used their paper, their pen. Patsy's DNA, I believe, was on. But I mean, she, it was her notepad. So. And it was her notepad, yeah. but there was a draft. Then they restarted and they wrote another thing. The ransom, as Colette Cox mentioned, um, it, it stated John's exact bonus from work the year before. And it mentioned faith and politics. Religion and politics was both a part of this letter, which was also interesting. So I've never heard of, in all the kidnappings of children, done with, in, in a house, right, overnight, um, a ransom letter that was this long. Like no one comes in to take a child and hangs out. They also, also pine, you know, anyway, and then we can get the pineapple. <laughs> oh yeah. The pineapple. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that if, if, if someone is going to um, argue for the intruder theory, they really have to find a compelling explanation for the letter. And I have yet to hear anything that really makes sense for, how and why an intruder would write the letter, why Patsy's handwriting, um, how an intruder would have handwriting that was exactly like Patsy's. I mean, it, it just doesn't add up. If Patsy writes the letter, then clearly she's the main suspect. And, and the Boulder police actually discovered that within the first three hours. They were analyzing that letter and they knew or identified her as a suspect quickly within the first three hours because they recognized that huge chunks of, of the letter were consistent with her handwriting. So. Right. Someone else mentioned that the ransom letter also mentions John being from the South and his Southern, what was it? His Southern intellect or don't use your <laughs> John Ramsey's. Oh, in the left. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so someone mentioned the tortures. They say, no, they wouldn't have tortured their own daughter. Um, that's questionable. The exact autopsy, the original autopsy is head trauma and, and then asphyxiation through the head trauma. That's fact. That's the autopsy. Later on, they came up with the stun gun and um, other things. And so maybe you can explain that a little bit too. I'm looking at some of the comments. Um, somebody, somebody said it, just because she wrote the letter doesn't mean it wasn't an intruder. If she believed it was Burke, she would have wanted to protect him. That's true, but Burke wouldn't have been an intruder. Burke was within the house. Um, I... I <laughs> I think the argument is that the letter has is connected to the crime. This is supposed to be a kidnapping, right? And the ransom letter is would presumably be the main suspect. So um, if, if Patsy writes the letter, she's connected to the crime. Even if she didn't do the crime or commit the crime, she's connected. There's, there's, there's no way around that, I think. Let's see. Why don't we... Yeah. Um but but what about the the stun gun is questionable too. 
Oh yeah, right. Like, pe people aren't talking. I mean, no, someone this, above said she okay. tortured her daughter, so I'm responding to that. Yeah, the the stun gun. I mean, the, so Lou Smith's theory of of the stun gun is debatable. Uh, a panel of experts assembled in 2016. There's an excellent documentary on it, and they argued that um, she had a lot of little blood. Uh, clots, I forget the name for it. There's a name for it when the blood, when you strangle someone, the blood tends to pool in different parts of the neck and the face. And um, their argument was that it was questionable about whether there's a stun gun. I mean, um, that it, it's almost like, it's almost like seeing um, random patterns and trying to match up a stun gun to fit um, the dots, the, the blood pooling. And so um, many, some of the experts there were quite adamant that um, they didn't think it was a stun gun because the, the, the supposed wounds from the stun gun were consistent with the blood clots on other parts of her face and neck. They weren't necessarily wounds per se. Yeah. And then I also want to mention some history with uh, Lou Smith. He came on the case later and he was hired by the DA. Right. Meaning he had a reason to do the intruder theory. That was his purpose, essentially. But yeah, patekia, patekia. Thank you. Some one of our listeners described what it is. It's, that's what. That's exactly right. And then um, some other things. So, and then as well as the, those that are saying that the handwriting analysis was not Patty. Some people are saying that. Thank you, Barbara, so much. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Not everyone celebrates Christmas, you know. Um, th those people were also hired by the DA. So just keep that in mind. Right, the DA. So one of the interesting things about this case is the DA clashed with the police. The police had a clear theory that the family did it, and the DA was was – more on the side of an intruder. So Lou Smith comes in. Um, Lou Smith comes in and, and endorses the intruder theory, um, which is consistent with the DA's bias. So did that play a role? Um, I don't know. I mean, according to Lou Smith, obviously it didn't, but um, but it's certainly another interesting part of the case that you know the hired gun in this case. Um, is clearly siding with the faction that believes there's an intruder and not the family. And then throw in the fact that after all of that, she was killed in the house and left in the house. Um, yeah, and all of the police, uh, the first, the police first on the scene, what they saw, even though evidence was, you know, uh, tainted, they all, the, the first officers on the scene all believed the family was involved. So, um, and Leah Vogel, that, thank you so much. Um, the actual handwriting analysis. Oops. I just want to put that up. By Sino showed many similarities. Trisha had her on web sleuths before we love web sleuths. That's thank you for sharing that Leah. Um, and then Jean, um, Marie said, let's talk about Jean Benet's chronic UTI and bedwetting issue. And I think that's a really important thing to bring up. And it goes with the first thing you mentioned about the family, this confirmation bias. Let's talk about some clues we have about who this family really is. Yeah. So the, actually I saw the comment and um, she, she asked the question whether bedwetting is associated with sexual abuse. I mean, I don't, uh, that would be a little bit of a stretch for me. I don't think the research shows that at all. But um, what it does indicate is so. So f there, okay, there's a couple of things to look at here. Um, the bedwetting has persisted for several years. Um, to me, that's a function of anxiety. I think that um, there's something going on in this family where there's an overwhelming amount of anxiety, and that's confirmed by the fact that Burke by the way, um, he also has, it's called enuresis. That's, so the bedwetting is enuresis. It's not controlling your bladder, 
past a normal age when that would be expected to occur. Um, but Burke also has something else, um, which is that he he has trouble con, con, um, controlling his ball movements, and that's called encopresis. What he does when that happens is he takes his feces and he smears them in the house. He smeared them in John Bonet's room a few times. Um, again, um, that's not a normal behavior for a nine-year-old. He's nine years old when he's doing that. In fact, that's a very hostile behavior. Um, that behavior, behavior would also be consistent with an inordinate amount of anxiety in the house. So um, getting back to this idea I started with about uh, the family romance, um, you know, the, 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 I, the notion that Lou Smith has that this is a perfect family is clearly – not necessarily the case. If you look at the bedwetting in John Bonet, if you look at the Burke's and Caprices and his smearing feces throughout the house, like clearly these kids are on edge. These kids are anxious. Is there abuse? There's no obvious signs of that. Is there sexual abuse? No obvious signs of that either. Um, but that doesn't mean that the children are that there aren't some emotional issues going on. There there seems to be some clear some very large and clear emotional problems in this, in this household. So um, the family system here is, is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Exactly. Um, what other questions do people have and what else would you like to talk about? I think you brought up really important points about the anxiety in the home. I feel like, and, and it is common, you know, for a child, if it was one child having bedwetting issues, that could just be coincidence. But when it becomes both children, plus the feces smearing, then. So there's a question here about why was there so much anxiety? Um, it's, it's a really good question. Um, it's not, it's not entirely, unfortunately, I wish I knew more about, Patty's upbringing, it's really hard to get good information about her upbringing, except that she came from a very healthy home. And I'm always skeptical of that, of course. But um, yes, I think the, 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 the question related to does it have something to do with um, the pageant life or Patty's expectations? I think undoubtedly it does. Patty is someone who's very interested in presenting a very particular image of this family. I, I think there's probably a lot of rigidity in the home in terms of her desire to control how the family looks to the outside world. Um, Patty seems like someone to me who is angry. I think, you know, you see that when she does her police interview, she's practically yelling at the police. So clearly, you know, Lou Smith said she never had a temper. But if you look at the police interview, she, that's not the case. She's getting really mad. Um, so um, she has a temper. I think she's a bit of a perfectionist. Perfectionism is usually based in shame to some degree. Um, so um, there's probably quite a bit of shame. I don't know. I wish I knew more about her upbringing. It's something I would definitely like to know. But uh, this family system is racked with anxiety. And I mean anxiety that's way above normal anxiety to the point where, um, and yes, somebody said the UTI could be, uh, uh, you know, a medical issue, but, um, they already had that checked out. It's, it's an emotional issue because it's persistent for years and, um, she's treated for other stuff and she's still wetting her bed. So it's, it seems to be clearly something that's emotional. The fact that Burke is, is putting feces in different rooms of the home, that, that's a, that's a very, very hostile behavior for a child that's nine years old. Um, even if, as people were pointing out, that Burke is on the spectrum, it's still an unusual behavior. I mean, it, it depends on – I've seen interviews with Burke. If he's on the spectrum, it doesn't seem glaringly obvious. So he seems like a fairly well-adjusted kid if he's on the spectrum. So, um, so something's, there's something amiss in this family. <laughs> Someone says, so what's your best guess on who did it? And someone else mentioned, please look at this case more closely. We we have and we understand that there's going to be differing opinions. We have uh, 
We've actually listened to full podcasts of the intruder theory. We've, we've looked at a lot. So this is our opinion, our strong opinion. And, but we have looked at quite a lot. Um, so T diva, great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> um, yeah. What's the best guess on who did it? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm we. I believe the family did it. How and why? Uh, I think one of the original detectives on this case, and I can't remember his name now. Uh, somebody would probably Steve. Somebody. He wrote a book. Later, he resigned um, because of, there was so much pressure from the DA that he was adamant in his belief that the, the incident started with bedwetting. Patty lost her composure. Um, she, he believed that he took John Bonet into the bathroom. She may have slipped and hit her head, uh, rendering her partially unconscious, and then the rest was a cover-up. In 2016, in some of the documentaries, they suggest that Burke was responsible in some way that Burke may have hit her over the head with a flashlight. Um, the, the, the wounds are consistent with a flashlight wound, um, according to one of the forensic pathologists, who's really, really adamant about that. The flashlight you can see sitting on the kitchen counter uh, isn't even taken seriously by police in 1996. But there's pictures of it, and the wounds are consistent with that. So um, what do I think? I, th I think it's probably some type of accident that then becomes covered up. You know, there's there's different types of of violence or aggression. Um, generally speaking, there's there's violence which descri was described as instrumental violence, and that's that's violence that's premeditated. That's violence that's planned. And then there's reactive violence, and that's not planned. And usually, you'll see uh, instrumental violence will occur, like in murder one charges. Uh, and reactive violence you'll usually see in manslaughter cases. So um, not always, you know, most prosecutors like to go for murder one. They like to argue that everything's premeditated. But um, I, I, I just don't see with the, with the letter and the handwriting matching up, I just don't see how you can move away from the family. In terms of specifics, I mean, of course, we'll never know, but I think it's it's probably likely that there was some type of accident and then some some type of cover up. Someone's saying we need a piece of felt under the on under the stand of the microphone, so we'll we'll lift it up and and here let, let's try this. And why don't you get a couple of these for yours? So when you set it down, <laughs> yeah, we weren't planning on sharing a mic and both being in here. So we'll lift it and they're saying it scrapes really loud. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So when we lift it, <clears throat> um, thank you canine handler for your comment. It's uh, she suggests it's because her mother expected Jean Benet to be perfect and that she grew up with a mom who forced her into pageants. Um, and then Julie Holden posted something. Where is it? And I want to share it because yes, this is true. Is it true that Patty was still wearing par party clothes she'd been wearing for a party the night before? If so, that seems like a big clue. Yes, Patty had not changed clothes since the night before. I mean, in other words, she could have put the same clothes back on, but... Right, and she... Is that better? <laughs> she... She, right. She didn't, she didn't sleep that night. Essentially. She wore the same clothes. If she did, she went to bed with her clothes. Obviously she was busy doing something writing a letter or covering up evidence, whatever was going on. But, um, and also John Ramsey, the father, he, when police came into the home, he was nowhere to be found for the first hour and a half. So there's some suspicion there too. Why wasn't he with the police? And the police thought it was a kidnapping, they weren't prepared for that. They didn't know what to do. They didn't close off the crime scene. So it was a disaster. Patty also called her friends over. I mean, it seems to me that there was some deliberate attempt to contaminate the crime scene, or if not that, then to buffer herself from the police, to create a wall between herself and the police so she didn't have to answer questions. Or to ignore the ransom letter's threats, which is don't tell police don't tell anyone. And now, and she's inviting everyone over, you know, she's also not heeding the warnings. Someone's mentioning the pineapple. Yeah. The pineapple, the pineapple. 
the pineapple is a is an amazing piece of evidence because generally speaking, um, also the pineapple goes hand in hand with a scream that one of the this isn't widely known, but there was a scream around midnight that is believed to have been John Bonet's that the neighbor heard, and they said it was one of the most blood curdling, awful screams they had ever heard. Um, why they didn't call police because of that, I don't know. They said that the scream happened very quickly and then it was shut off. So, if, and that was around midnight. So um, the pineapple theory is important because the pine we know that John Bonet had pineapple at some point that evening. We know also that it wasn't fully digested. Pineapple will, if you're alive, pineapple will digest quickly. But in this case, it didn't. So she got up at some point that evening, ate some pineapple, and was killed fairly soon after she ingested the pineapple, which which speaks strongly against the intruder theory because as some people have pointed out, it's highly unlikely that she sat down with the intruder and enjoyed pineapple with him or her that night. So um, the fact that the, the also Patsy's uh, fingerprints were all over the bowl with the pineapple and the spoon. So Patsy denies it, but there's evidence that she was, had some involvement in the pineapple that they found that evening or the bowl with the pineapple. I'll also say to this, um, it's back to the, what do you think happened then? I think that this is where we could both not somebody, somebody suggest. Yeah, we agree. We should, <laughs> we need to, if we're going to do this together, we need to get lav mic. Sorry. We'll, we'll do that. Um, somebody asked, um, or somebody, oh, back to, sorry, I, I read the comments and I apologize. I get lost, but, um, who did it or what happened? I think that John and I admit we both don't know exactly, but I have my opinion. And so this is Lauren's opinion, not even John's opinion. My opinion is that. Patsy is responsible that she got angry at um, that she got angry at Jean Bonnet. She lost her temper. We know that she has a temper. I believe it was probably accidental, but she knows she caused it. Um, her, you know, she had um, a severe injury, and they knew what the autopsy would show, and so they covered it up. That is my belief. Lauren's belief. Um, I want to. I want to acknowledge Pammy's statement about um, that the ransom note said that they were going to take her, and they didn't. I totally agree. That's one of the biggest arguments against the intruder theory. Is if there was an intruder and the kidnapping went wrong, why wouldn't the intruder take the body? It makes no sense, right? It's it's if you look at all the little pieces that they as they come together, it's really really hard, I think, to 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 say that the family had no involvement in this case. But yes, exactly. If this was a kidnapping, that's another problem with Lou Smith's theory. Is he, his theory is based on that the intruder was a pedophile or some type of a sexually violent predator? But it's not clear. You know, it appears that there were some injuries to her vaginal area, but it's not clear to what extent and how serious. And I mean, initially they said that it looked like the possibility of digital penetration, but, um, but I don't know, you know, as someone who do, I do a lot of sex crimes and, you know, it, they said initially that they couldn't determine whether, um, you know, they couldn't determine for sure whether that was the case, whether this was a sexual assault. The narrative changed over time. Over time, as the intruder theory developed, it became much more <laughs> – that, that, that part of it became much more aggressive and much more pronounced, that people were saying she was raped, um, that, you know, there was all kinds of damage to her um, vaginal area. I mean, I, I, that wasn't consistent with the initial thoughts. And the initial thoughts are important in these cases. The initial thoughts are really important. What everyone saw at first. Um, so, yeah, we're getting some questions about um, who would risk violating a 
child in a house full of people upstairs. Thank you, Jewel Chen. Um, so I think that's another important thing. Like who would, who would not only violate a child, but write, take that time to write a ransom note so long in the house, eat some pineapple <laughs> <laughs> or feed, <laughs> feed Jean Benet some pineapple and then um, write another ransom note because it was a draft, you know, in the house. Uh, it, there are cases of children being taken in the middle of the night and it's always swift. It's always fast. It's in and out. Um, Elizabeth Smart's one example. He wasted no time to get her out of the house. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the intruder theory is a red herring. You know, it's unfortunate that Lou Smith, I think, I think his intentions were good. Um, but, you know, I, I don't believe that the evidence is consistent with his views. Uh, in fact, there was a documentary just released in the last few weeks that details Lou Smith's version of the crime. I started watching part of it and I couldn't get through it because I so vehemently disagreed with what he was saying, but um, which is part of the nature of this case. I think it, it, it brings up a lot of emotions, um, but I have to, I keep going back to if, for Lou Smith, I keep going back to this idea that at the very beginning, he kind of laid out why he felt there was an intruder. And it had nothing to do with the evidence. It had to do with the fact that this was a good family that didn't drink. They didn't do drugs. They went to church. I mean, you know, if, if I did evaluations based on that, every one of the criminals I assess would be, <laughs> would be released or, or given probation. They wouldn't do any time. So uh, things are never what they seem, you know, for those of you who are into literature, um, certainly one of the great themes of literature is that human beings wear masks. The Ramses wore a lot of masks, no doubt. We all wear masks to some degree. It's just a question of degree. And so, um, you know, Lou Smith thought that the masks were reality and they weren't. Someone has a great question. We're getting a lot of opinions because people, after 25 years later, people have opinions on this case. But we got a great question here by um, Ivana Ivy. Why was Lou an apologist? What was in it for him? Well, he was hired by the DA. The DA believed that there was an intruder. So I think that, I think that created some bias right away. Um, in terms of why he was an apologist, I mean, I think, I don't, I, I think, you know, it's hard to say this about a seasoned homicide investigator, but I think there was some naivete, you know, you would think that after you've investigated 150 homicides, you might develop, you know, a, a fairly complex understanding of human beings but my feeling is that Lou he was a small town officer he worked in a small town in Colorado for most of his career um i think that there was some naivete about about the complexity of human beings and what they're capable of and this idea that we were masks i think Lou saw what he wanted to see like all of us maybe you know again somebody Somebody just made a comment about Daybell, um, you know, that, that you know, that how, how that's very true of the Daybell case, the masks. Um, but I, I think, I think for some people, it's very threatening to think that beneath the surface that there, there lurks something, you know, sinister in human beings. Uh, I mean, and, and as I said earlier, as someone who's now going back over World War II, I, I don't even... I can't even um, begin to fathom some of the atrocities that were committed there. It's just unbelievable what human beings are capable of. So sometimes it's easier to, to, to believe in a family romance and that people are, you know, good to the core no matter what. And that's probably not true. <laughs> so I turned the mic towards me and cough. Sorry. Back to Julie Holden's uh, comment, people thinking, masks are reality why is 
This is why Lori Vallow got away with so much, killing Charles Vallow in particular. On Dateline, John, you talked about how Lori Vallow went into the police station after Charles was killed and left with a victim's advocate. <laughs> right. You know, I think right. that that's a great example, would you say, of yes. how people wear masks. Yeah, I think Daybell's... Yes, Daybell's a little more complex in some. Oh, I don't know, maybe not. Um, uh, there are maybe some similarities. There's a similarity of filicide, of course, but um, but yeah. Um, uh, there was another question somebody had, and I'm looking. Well, I. I can't find a question now, but oh, here it is. Zaneda Rivera. Yeah, that's a great question, right? So the the grand jury came back with an indictment, um, not for murder, but for involvement in the crime. Um, why did the DA go against it? Because the DA thought there was an intruder. Because the DA, I think the DA also there. There's some political implications here that we don't know about. I think the DA. You know, I don't want to go too far with this, but I, the DA, I think, was very conservative. Uh, Boulder was a town where people weren't tried for murders ever, for homicide ever. I think the DA was probably afraid there wasn't enough evidence. He might lose it. That would be embarrassing. I think there were a lot of reasons. There were probably some political issues. The Ramses were wealthy. They had a lot of clout in Boulder. Um, they created jobs in that community. I mean, there's clearly some very political reasons, too, I think, but... But yeah, that was that was interesting that the the DA did not pursue charges. Jewel Chen, thank you. She said it's so thankful for this nice surprise YouTube live. Blessings to you both and Banks. I'm actually drinking caffeine right now because John and I are going to be up really late uh, hanging out with Santa Claus. And, uh, so thank you. Yeah. But we, we wanted to do this. It's Friday and, uh, we wanted to do this, but if any, everyone could do something for us tonight, it would be the greatest Christmas gift, um, for us, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It would mean so much. It helps us, uh, get noticed more on YouTube. And if you could please like this video, it would mean a lot to us. And that is how you could give back to us this Christmas. Yeah, there, there's so many great questions coming in. Um, could you go to Pammy really quick? Could you pin that? Um, yeah, so this is an interesting piece of the case that on, on John Bonet's uh, leggings and underwear, there were found some microscopic DNA that did not belong to any of the, did not belong to the Ramsey family or anybody that they knew. And so the presumption was that that had to do with the intruder. Um, so one of the, one of the issues there is that the, the amount of DNA and, and they were little specks of blood. Um, it was so minute. It was nanograms. Um, that, you know, there, that they, they could be explained by the manufacturing process. Um, people dispute that and they don't believe that, but this was a case where the DNA was, was scrutinized so carefully. Like I forget there's thousands and thousands of pieces of fibers and DNA and analysis. It was looked at the, the forensic evidence was looked at so closely in this case that they were finding like these little, little minute things that you'd never find in a typical crime scene investigation. And, and this was one of those things. And so, um, does that prove that there was an intruder? No, it's, it's, it's another gray area. Is it possible? Yeah, I guess so. But you still have to explain the note. You still have to explain the ransom note and you'd have to argue that the intruder wrote that note and not Patty Patsy. Yeah. I appreciated, uh, Jean Marie's, um, acknowledging someone with a different perspective on this case that she's reading and acknowledging. And, and we respect that too. You know, these are, we're sharing our theory. So um, everyone is allowed theirs. Hazelnut, thank you so, so much. 
Um, we're grateful to be doing it too. And, and a lot of people have mentioned they like us seeing us side by side. So maybe we'll have to buy some lav mics or figure out a way to get a good setup. Um, right now we don't have the most ideal setup to be in the same room, but we, we will work on it. I'm sorry. Sorry for the noise. We're, we're, we need, we just realized we need to get lav mics next time. So, um, yeah. So, right. I want to just reiterate what Lauren said that there's, there's no definitive answers. You know, if, if Patty is the perpetrator, she's deceased. So unfortunately that means that there's never going to be justice because she was never charged and she was always free. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think there's an argument to be made. Uh, I haven't talked about this yet in the podcast, but one of my favorite books of all time is Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. And why that is relevant here is because the perpetrator in that case, his name is Raskolnikov. It's fiction, of course, but Dostoevsky is is quite good at portraying things in a realistic fashion. Um, Raskolnikov thinks he can kill someone and get away with it without guilt. And in a nutshell, he's proven quite wrong. He's racked with guilt until he confesses. So for those of you who haven't read it, I hope I didn't spoil it. But um, but the but the point here is that there's some similarities, I think, with Patty. I think in spite of Patty's anger and defensiveness and denial, which she maintained until she died of ovarian cancer um, in 2006, I think she was racked with guilt. And I think that that guilt, like Raskolnikov, played a big role in her health and her well-being and in and, and her life post-tragedy. Um, so uh, I think it's interesting that... Um, you know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that she she died early, but um, I do think that uh, there may have been some issues around guilt that really ran deep with her. So, I mean, it, she, no doubt she loved her child. You know, there's some question about that, but I think she loved her child. It was just a very unfortunate situation. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, there were handwriting experts that stated it was written by Patsy. So, um, anything else you want to talk about? Any updates in the Daybell case as well? Anything else? Um, oh, someone's asking what your top favorite books are. That is like a loaded question for John. I don't know. If he, or do you have, do you have a top favorite? Is there one that's changed your life more than any other book? Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're good. Uh, what, um, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, real, that's a really hard question. Um, I think if I had to, if I had to take some books to a desert Island and read them over and over, they'd probably be Shakespeare. So Macbeth for the criminal mind, um, King Lear for family stuff, uh, Hamlet just for the c complexity of Hamlet and for depression, um, Othello for the nature of relationships and possessiveness and jealousy. Um, most of Shakespeare's tragedies, I, I love his comedies too, but they don't have the same resonance for, for me as tragedies because, well, I work with criminals. So I, I work with tragedy day in and day out. So probably the answer to the question is uh, probably Shakespeare. And I actually tell some of my grad students that um, if you really want to understand human nature, you know, oftentimes you're better off reading Shakespeare than going and reading psychological literature and research, although it's important to read both. So uh, I don't, I don't let them off the hook there, but um, it would be Shakespeare. Yeah. And any other personal questions, anything else you want to say about Jean Benet or I mean, other questions, or do you feel like we covered the most important thoughts on it? Um, so I don't, there was another, there was another, oh, somebody, somebody, um, somebody thanked us for our bravery for bringing up this case. Thank you. Yeah, we, we went back and forth about whether we should discuss this because um, it certainly doesn't have the clarity that the Daybell case has. And, and I want to acknowledge with Daybell, of course, that they haven't been tried, they haven't been convicted, but 
the evidence is much more clear cut with Daybell than it is here. Um, and I, I think some of the larger issues with the Ramsey case are also in some ways um, more complex um, in terms of pointing the finger at a family versus pointing the finger at, say, a cult. And yeah, this was a tough topic. So if we, um, if anybody else has any questions for us before we sign off, it can be personal questions or yeah. not too personal. <laughs> I mean, let's leave some things out, <laughs> but, uh, uh, before two and, and end on a lighter note, we can do that. Oh, and someone is asking if you can discuss John Ramsey. Yeah. Could you pin that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So never mind on that. Let's just go back to the, Jean Benet case for a second, and then and then if uh, we can answer any other questions. <laughs> um, yeah, you know John Ramsey's a little bit of an enigma too. I think um, my opinion of John, I don't know much about him either. Unfortunately, I think one of the um, one of my regrets in this case is not um, having enough information on both John and Patsy in terms of their upbringing and. Uh, people not delving deep enough into those areas. Patsy didn't speak to anyone during the whole process, so she's something of an enigma. But if you look at John in the room with Patsy, he seems distant. I think John Ramsey, is he tends to be pretty unemotional. He seems to be pretty disconnected from Patsy. Uh, I don't know about the nature of the marriage, but I think, and this is speculative, but I think it's it's reasonable to assume that their marriage wasn't particularly close. Sure, he stayed with her until the end, probably out of loyalty. However, I think one of the dysfunctions in this family was that Patsy was getting her emotional needs met through the children. So that she was very enmeshed with the kids. She probably, she doesn't appear to be very close to John. I think John um, was emotionally distant. I think he wasn't very connected to her. Um, he seemed to be more connected to the kids. In fact, after when police entered and after they found the body, John Ramsey and Patsy were separate. They were in separate rooms. That was one of the things the police noticed is that in these types of tragedies, when a child dies, the couple is almost always together and they're trying to console each other. Not true with the Ramseys. Patsy was on the couch in the fetal position almost, wailing and upset. And John was off in a corner of the house by himself, he got on the phone and he tried to get a plane, a private plane back to Georgia, back to Atlanta, which is where they re they initially lived. Um, but John was, was quite um, removed from Patsy and that's unusual. So again, if you're going to look for dysfunction in the family, I think there was something, uh, something lacking in the marriage that, that created some tension in the marriage. We have more people disagreeing with us. <laughs> it's okay. Will you, since you have the mic, will you put yeah. that? It's okay for anyone that wants to disagree with us. Yes. We're, uh, we're you know, we, we expect disagreement in a case like this. Uh, we don't have all the answers. We certainly don't. We, we know that there's a gray area here. Uh, could there have been an intruder? Sure. You know, I always talk about the idea that my job is to assess probabilities. Is there a probability here that an intruder entered the house and committed the crime? Sure, absolutely. I think I'd probably put that at maybe 10%. I don't know. Family, probably 90%. So, you know, so it is certainly possible, and there's compelling arguments to be made for that. Um, they just don't happen to be arguments that we're making. <laughs> Right. So no harm, no foul to those who disagree there. And there are plenty of podcasts and books with both sides. So we're just sharing ours. Um, Dr. John is a jock and a brainiac. That's true. I'm going to say something. So John played football at Princeton while studying philosophy. So um, I don't know where he came from, <laughs> but you're right. He is both. Um, it's amazing. Um and I had never watched a football game in my life until <laughs> I met you, um, which I still haven't. Um, someone else asked what you got me for Christmas.
since I've already given her this present, I can say, but I got her some some Apple earbuds. And, and for the lipstick I'm wearing, I don't remember. Pamela asked that. It is a it's a lipstick that doesn't uh, move. Like I have to take it off with alcohol. So probably not very healthy for my lips, but it's fun when I wore this. This is the lipstick I wore for our wedding reception, which was five years ago next week on, on New Year's Eve. So. Okie dokie. Thank you. Could you, could you post that comment? Yeah. Thank you very much. Many blessings to you too for Christmas and the holidays. Um, we really appreciate our listeners, of course. We acknowledge that we have wonderful listeners. We have a wonderful community in the true crime world, and we're so grateful, and we never forget that. And um, it's been a very good year. We we ended with the dream come true by meeting Keith Morrison and being on Dateline. So that was a lot of fun. We're very grateful for that. We recognize we never would have gotten there without you guys. So um, thank you very much. All right. And then somebody else asked, I missed a lot of questions, what we had for Christmas Eve dinner. Um, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but that's not usually what we do. We usually go to In-N-Out Burger but it's been a pretty stressful day. So um, we have not yet eaten. Or did you eat something? You said you were starving. So you're yeah, trying no, to get I haven't something. eaten either. We still might make it to In N Out because Lauren's mother is visiting enough. So, <laughs> uh, and Banks is asleep. So, um, uh, anyway. It's. I noticed we're we, we're trying to keep this to an hour tonight, but because um, we have a lot of of gift wrapping to do. But uh, why don't we why don't we just let's open it up to questions? If just anything, if you guys want, um, we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us on Christmas Eve and to talk about the the Ramsey case. It is a very complex case. We've just scratched the surface. Lauren and I had even talked about maybe doing a couple of bonus content or bonus episodes podcast episodes on this case, but um, we're not fully decided on that because it's so controversial. And I think I would need to know more about the families and the backgrounds of the, of the, of John and, and Patsy Ramsey before I could really make a full assessment. I can't say what I got John for Christmas because um, he doesn't know yet. But <laughs> So, um, I don't think he's expecting much. I think that's why he's laughing. <laughs> I'm, yeah, he'll get something. <laughs> I got, I got a, this, babe. <laughs> she's given me her heart as always, and that's more than enough. So, thank you for that. Anytime. Um, John doesn't follow the Delphi murders, but I do. Megan Music's asking my thoughts. I think that actually is one that I, oops, want to get John into, but I'm very interested in the new leads they have. And um, I, I am hoping for justice for those two little girls, so much so. Leanne Hicks is asking a, um, a Jean Benet Ramsey question. What are your thoughts about the way she was tied up? Uh, I, I think that would be consistent with the staging the murder, staging the, the murder scene, the body. Um, the garrote was horrible, of course. Um, that's what makes this so incredibly unbelievable that, that parents could do something like that. Um, it's what makes it so horrifying. And I think that's why, that's why Lou Smith, gravitated towards the intruder theory because nobody wants to think that the, a parent could do that to a child, including us, of course. But, um, I think we, we just, you know, we have to, we have to follow as much, follow what we believe the evidence says. So how we interpret it. 
Are there any other cases that are piquing our interest? Oh, here's a, a question about from Rainy April. Okay. Yeah, this so this is a really interesting question, Rainy. Um, it's something I've thought about a great deal. Uh, I, I think it's a good point because I've seen forensic psychologists weigh in on the, the Ramsey case and and basically say that they believe that Patsy didn't have any mental health problems and that the family was pretty well adjusted. Um, but I, I agree with you that that just because she's not so in showing signs of psychosis or severe mental illness, which is what some forensic people have said, that she doesn't show any signs of psychosis, that doesn't mean she's not capable of murder. And it doesn't mean that she doesn't have a personality disorder. I think there are some hints of personal of personality disorder with, with Patsy. So I just don't have enough information to make that assessment. And unfortunately, she... She never talked. She never interviewed. She was just largely unavailable uh, after the crime was committed. So it's really hard to know much about her. She's she's a bit of an enigma. I do think the perfectionism, the shame, the bedwetting by her children, uh, both of her children, points in the direction of some issues for sure. So there could have been a personality disorder. I'm not sure what I would say that is at the moment, but. Definitely a good idea. And rest in peace, Patsy, too. You know, we have empathy for her, and she suffered with cancer, and she died young and left her little boy. Um, so um, we still have empathy for her. <coughs> um, uh, any other cases? People are saying that are catching your attention. Uh, that was another question that I thought you could. Let's see. What are we talking? What are we? The case in. Uh, what's the the case in um, Eastern Utah? Oh yeah, um, the the victim no longer wants her name being mentioned because she's a sexual assault survivor, according to immediate evidence according to the probable cause. But um, in Loa, Utah, a man took a Snow College student to his home 80 miles away in Loa. And so Snow College is in Ephraim, Utah, and uh, held her for days. And according to the probable cause, she said she was raped multiple times a day. She was hiding in coal. Police found her. And we would... Yeah, we've become very interested in that and that man who, uh, his name is, I just forgot his name, Brent Brown, I believe. Someone correct me if that's not exact, but I think it's Brent Neil Brown is the person arrested and charged in um, rape and object rape. And so that is, yes, something we're following. And then... Um, Another cult, I can't say much, but I am addressing another cult out of uh, Utah right now, and we'll have more information on that soon. Is it Utah or Idaho? Utah. Okay. Utah. Um, but we will be doing some discussions and interviewing with that soon. We have a podcast about the Josh Duggar case, which I know is over now. He, he has been, well, he hasn't been sentenced, so that we're still awaiting that. And then... Do you want to talk about Israel Keys and Oh yeah. So so we yeah, so we we still have some episodes left on Daybell. Um one of the problems we're running to with Daybell is that they keep releasing more evidence and more documents, which makes it kind of a moving target. So well, we have a podcast episode coming out hopefully reasonably soon that we've had to go back and edit repeatedly because of the new information. And um, we've learned that focusing on an active case is much more difficult than taking on a case that's already been adjudicated. So we are looking at Israel Keys very closely, and um, that's going to be our second season. And 
uh, there's so many issues in there of interest to me um, that uh, we hope you guys will will listen to that and tune in. Um, and to those interested in some other cases, we do have um, some other discussions on our Patreon um, subscription. We do that for those that are able to support us. We want to give back. And so we discuss on our Patreon podcast, um, Josh Duggar. We discuss, I'm going blank on some names right now. Um, the Turpin case. The Turpin children. The Turpin children. Yeah, we've been really invested in that. <coughs> um, I'm going the 14 year old i forgot his name the i'll look it up aiden fucci thank but. you aiden fucci it's been a long day everyone <laughs> <laughs> i've been up early and i'll stay up late so right and, and we're nowhere near done with our day so um right uh anyway so why don't we I guess we should wrap this up, but thank you guys for joining us. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. Uh, hopefully we've given you some food for thought on the John Benet Ramsey case. Um, as if you wanted it or like it or not, we gave you th food for thought. Uh, we realize it's controversial, but um, those are some of our initial thoughts on the case. And um we hope that you guys will join us on future lives. Yeah. And um, someone mentioned Susan Powell. That one is actually of interest to me. I was a reporter when she disappeared, and I was very invested in that case as a reporter and followed it from the beginning before there were any podcasts on it. And so I'm, I'm, it was heartbreaking to see what happened in the end because I felt from the very beginning. Josh was responsible and we, I think most people definitely did. So, and to those that are saying they can't support our Patreon, of course we understand. And that's why we do these lives and videos for YouTube too. So we, we understand that not everyone can do that. So we will continue to give to people here as well, of course, and, and wanted to spend Christmas with all of you. So we're going to go play Santa Claus. I'm going to go figure out what to get you for Christmas. <laughs> I think it's a little late. There's nothing open at this point. Um, Should we go to In-N-Out? Are they still open? Yeah, I don't know. We may have to go to In-N-Out. I'm starving. But anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Happy holidays. We look forward to a lot of exciting things in 2022. Uh, we hope to have you guys on board with us. And um, thank you so much. So. Take care. Good night. Good night.